Well, we are certainly excited about this impending wedding. If you're visiting with us today, uh, we've had three marriages in about uh, just a little over three months. I'm not sure what biblical principle is being applied here other than we truly disciple the whole person. So if you are single and you're coming to Metro, beware. We're going to be involved in your lives. Now, we are very, very excited about this. You know, another just brief comment on membership. Uh, Aaron did a great job of explaining that. Um, we were very deliberate about walking with uh, Victoria through membership prior to marriage. And I'll tell you why. A couple of reasons. One, we wanted to send the message that she is covenanting with this body and you are covenanting with her individually. Okay? Uh, salvation is an individual thing, though we certainly appreciate the, uh, the gift of marriage and that we have helpmates and we do, do life together. But another reason uh, is a bit pragmatic, and that means that she has connections, ligaments, tendons, spiritual connections with this body of believers so that if things ever go sour, it's not just Ryan we know. It's Victoria we know, and she knows us. And I'm absolutely convinced that a key to a healthy marriage, because marriages get tough sometimes, right? Key to a healthy marriage is church. Is church. Not attending church. It's being the church, being here. And so, again, if you're visiting with us, we have uh, a very high view of covenant membership. We're really not interested in, uh, in numbers, though we pray that the Lord multiplies us greatly. But what we're interested in is faithfulness, in seeing people come to know Jesus Christ and grow to be like Him. And you just can't do it by attending a service. You do it by covenanting with a body of believers and doing life together. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for watching that with us. And Victoria, we are so glad to have you. Well, we are in the sixth letter today, the church at Philadelphia. If you're taking notes, the title of the sermon is Church of the Open Door. And that'll, uh, that'll become more clear as to why we chose that title as we go through the text. Before we get going here, uh, I wanted to illustrate something, if I may. You know, everyone recognizes the Colosseum in Rome, postcards movies, maybe you've been there. You know, this, this Colosseum that is nearly 2,000 years old is one of the ancient wonders of the world. Still standing today, you can go inside, walk around it. And yet it is clearly something that is sort of bittersweet for Christians because, you know, Christians were persecuted and even killed there. What you may not realize is that there is a smaller, even more preserved version north in the Veneto region of Italy, in a town called Verona. You may recognize Verona. That's where Shakespeare's fabled uh, Romeo and Juliet was set. Verona's a thriving city, a quarter of a million people, and in the very center of town is this Colosseum. In fact, they have concerts there weekly. It's so well preserved. The town is very medieval, and you have this, uh, this unique mixture of, of a medieval town with with dotted uh, landmarks of Roman archaeology. And yet, the city itself is very syncretistic. It's very uh, worldly. Uh, it's full of Mariology and relics. And when Joy and I were there recently, we were there on a Sunday, and we said, boy, we sure would like to go worship. I don't imagine there's an English-speaking church here. But we started looking for an evangelical church, and sure enough, we found one. They only spoke Italian, but we were pleased to go worship with them. We walked in to a small rented facility, and I think I had mentioned about a month ago, and there was about 20 folks there. And we quickly realized that there was more than meets the eye. 20 folks, small rented center, and yet what we saw in those doors was the power of the gospel. 
overwhelming power of the gospel in ways that you don't think about, especially here in America. Uh, not only was the word of God preached, not only did they sing joyfully, but we looked at the people around us and we realized these are people who have stood the test of time. Both in front of us and behind us were ladies who were in their 90s. And I remember this elder coming up and introducing us to these ladies and saying, these are our mascots. <laughs> and he was serious. These are our beloved saints. And, and, and I got what he meant, but it was only later that I realized this church had been around 50 years without a building, without a big budget, without financing, without any sort of fame. This church had stood the test of time and boldly proclaimed the gospel and boldly shared the good news of Jesus Christ over and over again. Twenty in a town of a quarter million? Most, most people would say, well, that's, that's not very successful. Oh, but according to the Bible, it was. Because lives were being changed. In the midst of a dark world, lives were being changed. And so it is with the church of Philadelphia. They're a small church in a larger town, and their influence may seem insignificant. They may even feel like they're not doing a lot, and yet to read this letter, they are doing a mighty work. Why? Because they have kept the word of the gospel and they have not denied the name of Christ. And as a result, Christ is using his word to transform lives. I don't know if you think about it that way, but it's not the size of the congregation. It, it, it's not your influence. It's not the numbers. It is people being faithful with the word of God and then watching the word of God do its work. Christ had opened a door and he was saving a people for his own possession. Chuck Swindoll says it well. He's now, I think, 88 years old. He says, quote, the size of a congregation, the limitations of its location or the restrictions of its budget should never determine its vision. Instead, churches should set their vision based upon the power of their God. Amen. God is infinite, magnificent, awesome, and mighty, beyond description or comprehension. When he chooses to open opportunities, the possibilities are endless. All we need to do is trust and follow him wherever he leads. That's so true. My former pastor was chaplain of Dallas Seminary when, when Chuck Swindoll was there. Chaplain Bill Bryan, who went to be with the Lord not too long ago. He said it in a little more plain way. He said, Roddy, everyone these days seems to focus on the three B's of success. Buildings, butts, and budgets. We got it all wrong. It's faithfulness. That's the mark of success, biblically. Faithfulness. And as we enter into a new year, we are Certainly thankful for the Lord bringing us through last year. But I think all of us are feeling, I'm assuming, a little trepidation as we look into the future. Things are darker than they have been in the past. Uh, yeah, the statistics show Christianity is on the wane. Membership is way down in churches. The view of inerrancy is being discredited universalism and soft plural, pluralism, many ways to heaven is being embraced even by evangelical Christians. We've all been through the whole COVID debacle and seen the overreach of the government. I think there are tough times ahead, and I think this book is so applicable for us. It is so necessary on how we as a church can be successful in the one thing that matters, the one thing that matters, are we being a faithful witness? Are we doing the Great Commission work, whether we're 20, 200, or 2,000? 
are we simply sowing the seed, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, and then watching the miracle take place in people's hearts? And so that's why I'm so excited today to study this church in Philadelphia. Why don't you pray with me, and we'll look at the text together. Oh, gracious Father, we come before you, and we earnestly pray that you would open our hearts and minds to understand this text. There's some interpretive challenges, but the main idea is very clear. And I pray that we would look at this church of Philadelphia and we would say that that is our go-to text. That's what we want to understand as a church. That's what we want to be like. We want to hear the high praise from our Lord Jesus Christ And we also want to hear the call to keep on keeping on. Father, we haven't haven't suffered. We haven't endured persecution. We don't even know what it's like. And yet it seems that during our generation, we will be able to find out. May we be found faithful, joyously faithful. May we persistently pursue the lost, diligently study your word, earnestly desire to meet and worship. And may we graciously use our gifts and the things that you have put in our possession for your son's glory. May we live, I mean, live for the very reason we have been left here, to take part in the advancement of Christ's kingdom. As each day draws near, as as we know he is coming back, and it could be at any time, may we be about his business. Ambassadors for the king, being ready to give a defense for the hope that is within us, proclaiming to a lost and dying world the only way of salvation. May we not be ashamed at all to talk about Christ over and over and over again. May we do what others did for us. They risked their relationship with us to share us the good news of Jesus Christ. Give us this passion. Give us this fire. Lord, may we start to run hard spiritually now so that when tough times come, throwing a 50-pound burden or a, a pack on our back will not even phase us. May we be about discipling the whole person helping people come to know Jesus Christ and grow to be like him. May we cast aside the complacent, anemic, evangelical Christianity that we see today. And may we preach the truth of God's word and live it. Father, we cannot do any of this in our own strength. And even talking about it makes our knees weak because who is up to such a task? But grace is not turning a blind eye or a deaf ear to sin. Grace is the power of God to save a man. And so I pray that the the power that you put within us for salvation would carry us through day by day. May we be disciplined. May we be devoted to put our Lord Jesus first in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this is a heavy text. I can't tell you how many times during my study this week that I said, this is, this is going into part one and part two. And it may happen today. It depends. Uh, there's a lot here. There's so much. I think I read eight, maybe nine commentaries. And I feel like I left 90% of it on the cutting room floor. You could teach an entire seminary class on just this text. But we don't want to lose the forest for the trees, so we're going we're gonna to make it through today in a pretty good clip. And, uh, and so probably the best way is to look at it in bite-sized chunks. Write down these four titles, and it might help us a bit. Kingdom Doorkeeper, An Open Door, sound like Jeopardy, don't I, given the titles? Vindication and Preservation, and I'll say these again. And then finally, fellowship with the king. Kingdom doorkeeper, an open door, vindication and preservation, and number four, fellowship 
with the king. I think if we can break it apart like that, it will start to make sense. Our timeless truth is this. Everything's going to point to it. Jesus advances his kingdom through faithful churches by empowering, vindicating, and protecting them, but calls them to hold fast until the end to inherit eternal life. Jesus advances his kingdom through faithful churches by empowering, vindicating, and protecting them, but calls them to hold fast until the end to inherit eternal life. I want us to study this text today with a view to being like this church. There's going to be some connections, some parallels, but I want us to strive to be like this church. I want us to see Christ rightly. We're going to see that in the first point, kingdom doorkeeper. I want us to advance his kingdom diligently, and I want us to trust in his sovereignty and persevere to the end. This is going to be sort of the life cycle of a church, not like... um, uh, Barna would give us, where, where it grows and crescendos and plateaus and dies. No, 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 no. We want this to be the life cycle of a church that moves towards eternity, anxiously awaiting our Lord Jesus Christ. And so anytime you, you see something that you like in the Church of Philadelphia here, write it down and say, I, I want to be the guy, the gal that helps Metro become more like the Church of Philadelphia. Isn't that a good way to look at this? All right, well, let's look at the first one. Kingdom doorkeeper. Look at verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open, says this. Now remember, with each of these introductions to the seven churches, we see a particular aspect of our resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, one that is particularly applicable to the needs of the church, either to encourage or to exhort. And as you look at this here, you say, well, I don't don't recognize anything here from that chapter one vision. These seem to be a, a bit of a departure, but they're certainly here for a reason nonetheless, and we'll discover it as we progress through the letter. Look with me, if you will, at these three descriptions. Our resurrected Lord is holy, is true, and has the key of David. A key that opens doors that no one can shut and closes a door that no one can open. You'll notice that with Philadelphia, along with Smyrna, these are the only two churches, the second and the sixth, that have no condemnation. There's only encouragement, commendation. There's no correction. You'll also notice that with both of these churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that uh, the problems don't seem to be nearly as directly related to the imperial cult, but more with the Jews and the synagogue in the particular town. Look at verse 9 with me. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. And we saw that same phrase, synagogue of Satan, in chapter 2, verse 9, with regards to the church at Smyrna. So understanding these things, how does this church fare? Well, before we get there, Let's continue to look at this description of Christ. It's not just a flowery statement. Oh, he's holy. Oh, he's true. Maybe we'll throw in something there. He's got the key of David. No, these are very specific descriptions based upon the challenges of the church. So if the church is being challenged, being threatened, being persecuted by the local synagogue, by the Jews, and we know that's true, because not only what's written here, but we know how the Jews are, are creating problems for the Christians. Do you remember what sort of king's ex the Jews had in the Roman Empire? Remember, they didn't have to pay homage to Caesar. They did not have to worship Caesar in the imperial cult. 
They didn't have to burn incense. They didn't have to make a pledge. They, they, they had an exemption. But they had begun to make it clear that those Christians on the other side of town, they may have Jewish names, but they're not Jews. And they were ratting on them. They were, they were talking to the Roman officials, saying, don't give them the same sort of uh, excuse that we have. They're not us. They're a cult. Okay? So that's what's going on. And so with these descriptions, John is going to encourage this church. Let me explain. Holy does not just mean set apart. Doesn't just mean pure. Holy is a messianic title. The Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. They're saying, your Lord is the true Messiah. The demons explain, exclaim it in Mark chapter 1, verse 24. What business do we have to do with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. Peter proclaims it in John chapter 6. We have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So when, when John says, Jesus the resurrected Lord, the Holy One, he's saying immediately, though you may have been rejected by the synagogue, though they may be coming against you, though they may be saying they are the true ones, you serve a true Messiah. In fact, that's what it says. He is the true one. Jesus is the genuine Messiah. Why were they kicked out of the synagogue? Why were the Christians excommunicated? Because the Jews would say, you serve a fake Messiah. John is saying, no, 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 no. You serve the one true Messiah, the Holy One of God. Well, I want you to think about this. Not only is he holy and true, but he holds the key of David. The key of David that opens a door. When they were kicked out of the synagogue, those doors were shut. Boom. They were erased from the book of membership. You see, the Jews taught that if you want to have eternal life, if you want to have fellowship with God, it's got to come through the synagogue. We have a direct line to Yahweh. We have a direct line to the temple. You study the Old Testament scriptures, it's got to come through ethnic Israel. What is Jesus saying here? And he's saying, uh-uh. I'm the Holy One of God. I am the true one. I hold the key that opens the door. I hold the key of David, the son of David. He's drawing it from Isaiah chapter 22. Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut. When he shuts, no one will open. What's interesting about all this is that this church at Philadelphia, though small, though probably discouraged, though rejected by their family and friends, though persecuted by the local Jews and the synagogue, many of which were probably family members, Jesus comforts them with who he is. He didn't comfort them with easier circumstances. He comforts them with who he is. He is the true Messiah. He is the genuine one. He is faithful. And he alone holds the key to eternal life. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He was given complete control, complete access to God. You got to go through the messianic doorkeeper for eternal life. You think that might be encouraging to them? To know, amidst all the circumstances, to know that, yeah, Jesus is real. Jesus is the only way. We do follow a risen Savior. Well, look at our second point, an open door. We're going to see this, this theme continue. Verse 8, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut. 
because you have a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Though the Jews had shut the door to the synagogue, Jesus provides an open door to the only door that counts, eternal life, the one into the kingdom. He is the doorkeeper to the kingdom. But there's more here, too. If Jesus has the key to the open door, the key to the kingdom, who does he entrust this key or these keys to? That right there should sound a little familiar to you. Matthew chapter 16. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? You remember what Simon Peter said? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Now, I don't know what interpretation you've heard of that before, but let me assure you, Peter was not the bishop of Rome. He was not the first bishop of Rome, and he was certainly not the pope of Rome. The keys are not given to Peter as an individual. Peter is a representative of the apostles. The keys are given to the church. We know that because you look at Matthew chapter 16 and it closes out the pericope in chapter 18. And the keys that are given to the church are not the keys of salvation, no matter what Rome may say. They are the keys to bind and loose that which has been bound and, law and loosed in heaven. All right? We reflect... We talked about this recently. We reflect, the church reflects what has happened in heaven. It reflects the miracle that God does. That's what we do at baptism, right? Okay, at baptism we're saying, hey, we've heard their testimony. There's a clear gospel. We've seen their life. There is a credible profession of faith. Therefore, we are going to baptize. Baptism doesn't save anyone, but it reflects what has happened in their heart. And so these keys to the kingdom, which only Jesus has, he gives to his church. And so what we see here is this, this unique thing where Christ is in church, encouraging the church of Philadelphia that even though they're small and they seem to have a little bit of power and they seem to just have a little bit of influence, in fact, it is magnificent because they serve a risen Savior who is holy, true, and holds the keys to the kingdom of which they have been brought into the kingdom. The door is open for them, right? He also gives them the keys of the open door. And what do they do? They advance his kingdom by proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ and there is only one way through the door. And they reflect what has happened when there is a regenerate heart and they baptize and they witness but there's, there's even more here. We also see this open door phrase throughout the New Testament, and it's used to mean the kingdom advancing and admitting work of the church. Tell me if you don't recognize these verses. 1 Corinthians 16, 9. For a wide door of effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. 2 Corinthians 2, 12. Now when I came to Troas... For the gospel of Jesus Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord. Colossians 4 3, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up for us a door for the word, that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned. So, what exactly is this door? If in our first point that Jesus holds the key of David, which opens the door, he is the one who controls admittance into the kingdom. What is the open door here? Well, G.K. Beale explains it well. He says, the open door given to the church at Philadelphia refers not only to the church's salvation, but also to their witness to that salvation, which Christ has already begun to make effective in the community. Let me read you another quote by another commentator. Though the open door primarily means the church's own assured entry, entry 
into the new Jerusalem, it is also the way by which others are brought in. Now, let me apply some of this. Aren't we in a similar situation, maybe even the same situation as the church at Philadelphia? We're not a big church. Now, we haven't been around as long as they had. But, um, but are we trying as best we can to faithfully teach and proclaim the Word of God? Say yes, encourage your pastor. Okay, okay, yeah, good, all right. Are we trying as best we can, hopefully, and even more so in the new year, to be a faithful witness in the community, actually talking about the gospel, using words where necessary, which is every time, okay, <laughs> and imparting our life? I mean, isn't that our theme verse, imparting the word, imparting our life? Yes. And so not only has Christ miraculously brought us through the open door to the kingdom, that we're citizens of heaven, but he's also given us the privilege and the keys to point the way to the open door by proclaiming the gospel and living it out, right? I don't care how small you were in the first century. I don't care how much you were getting persecuted. That right there would encourage you more than any change in your circumstances. Jesus has not only saved you, and you have citizenship in the new Jerusalem, the eternal kingdom, but he's then turned around and said, hey, I want you to tell anyone and everyone how to get here too. What a privilege. What an amazing privilege. It, it just gives, it gives significance to your life. It gives a reason to live. And this Philadelphia church, those small with a, a seemingly insignificant influence actually had a very powerful influence because they had been given the word of God that changes lives. You know, one more thing as I look around, I think about how that witness changed my heart, how it broke through my stony heart. And I know it did yours as well. That right there is how we encourage one another as we go forward into difficult times. So like my friend used to say, well, Brown, isn't this what you signed up for? Isn't this what we signed up for as Christians? We didn't just, just sign up for eternal life. We got to be in Christ's army. We enlisted under the captain of our salvation. We get to represent the king. You want to hear a little historical fact about the rest of the story? Robert Murray McShane tells us that until the 1800s, there were faithful churches in the city of Philadelphia. There were 800 Christians until the 1800s still living in Philadelphia. Five churches still operating, still opening their doors in Philadelphia. What a legacy. What an amazing legacy. If you're to go there today, that's all changed because it's Turkey. And the Muslim influence is so great, so overwhelmingly strong. But what, what a legacy to last that long. How did it happen? Faithfulness. Faithful witness. Recognizing that they served the king of the open door and they were pointing people to an open door. That allowed them to survive. That fueled their perseverance. And this word-fueled, chin-to-the-wind, open-door understanding needs to be the reasons that we persevere. We need to have the right mindset. And as a result, we need to stand boldly on the exclusivity of Christ. We need to trust fully 
that He has sovereignly saved us. We need to risk relationships because we love people so deeply we want them to spend eternity with us. Let's look at our third point. Vindication and preservation. Now he's going to go from helping them understand what has been done to what he will do. Look at the future action verbs there in verse 9. I will cause. Verse 10, I will also keep. Let me read it for you. Verse 9, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not and lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. I wrote down, because of your faithful witness, I will vindicate you. I will vindicate you. Now in Isaiah, about three times, and then also in Psalm 86, Old Testament Jews are promised that no matter how difficult things get, that one day God will cause the enemies of Yahweh to come bow down and acknowledge that He is the one true God. And this, this seemingly ironic set of events, He's saying now that it's the Jews that are going to come pay homage or bow down before the Christians and admit Jesus is Lord. So when did that happen? Maybe the better question is, when will it happen? And what we start to see here in these letters is an eye to the future, okay? We've seen how Christ is saying, I'm coming quickly to the church at Ephesus and I will remove your lampstand if you don't go back to your first love, right? Here we start to see a view to the future, and I'll explain in a moment. But this seems to be looking down the annals of time, and this seems to be an encouragement to all churches that you will have enemies in ministry. You will have people do you dirty. It's not that they hate you as much as they hate the Lord Jesus Christ and what's going on. But rest assured... Christ will make things right. One day they will acknowledge the truth that Jesus is the Christ and that he has loved his church. When will this happen? I think Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. This vindication is meant to encourage, and I would say, remove the burden from all churches. Let, let me explain it this way. I don't, want to, I don't want to distract the preaching of God's Word, but I want you to think about it just for a moment if you have been done wrong in ministry. It's painful. Have you been betrayed in ministry? I have. It's, it's painful. He's saying, let it go. Rest. God will work it out in due time. Leave it with Him. Be about Christ's business. Be about the building of His kingdom. Let it go. I can't remember where I read it. I believe it to be true. If not, it's a good illustration. We're going to use it. Um, Jonathan Edwards was really, really done wrong in his ministry at Northampton. And it was by one, one or two people, but one in particular really made his life difficult. He ended up getting run out of his church. And he kept and kept on really making life difficult for Jonathan Edwards. And someone asked him one day, and they said, why don't you fight back? Why don't you just tell the truth out there? Why don't you go head to head with this guy? And he said, because if I do, it ends there. But if I leave it with Christ, the gates of hell will not prevent him from setting things right. 
What he's doing is he is removing the burden from a beleaguered church and saying, leave the justice to Christ. Rest assured, I will make things right. Those who have done you wrong will acknowledge, not just that Jesus is the Christ, but I love it here. They will acknowledge that Jesus loved you, that Jesus loved his church. He wants to fuel their endurance. He also wants to fuel their endurance and their perseverance by assuring spiritual survival. How are we doing on time here? Woo. We're not congregational. Are you going to give me 10 minutes or do I go to next week? Let me read for you the next verse and I'll let you decide. The only time we'll ever vote, right? Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, verse 10, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Pretty controversial verse, right? What about we push to next week? <laughs>